Hey everybody, I'm really excited about today's episode. I talked with Jason Fight, and we had a really great conversation about building leaders in the military. Jason explains why he reads biographies rather than traditional leadership books, and why indecision is the Achilles heel of leadership. We talked about how understanding your own strengths and weaknesses is foundational to any leadership position, and about his upcoming role as a new commander of a naval warship. I learned so much from this conversation and can't wait for you all to learn too. Without any further ado, here's my conversation with Jason Fight. All right, welcome to the Building Thinkers podcast. Today I'm joined by Jason Fight, and we will uh, explain our connection here in a moment. Um, but I'm so excited. First of all, Jason, thank you so much for agreeing to come on and talking with us today. Thanks for having me, Tracy. And we are going to get into all things leadership. Uh, we, we have a connection here around training and development, but we're going to take the, the leadership lens and um, a military lens today. So I'm so excited to get into that. It's not my background or area of expertise, so I'm so excited to learn from you. And let's go ahead and kick off. So how are we connected, Jason? Yeah, so we are second cousins once removed. So your grandpa is the little brother of my great grandpa. So uh, and then we both went to Texas A&M at the same time. I, I think we're the same high school class year even. Um, and have several mutual friends in common as well. So we didn't really grow up together, just kind of, uh, you know, I saw your dad at different events and your older brother more. Uh, and then just as we got into adulthood, just started seeing each other a little bit more. So, yeah, it's been so fun to get to reconnect. We got to reconnect the other month and, um, to get to know your sister Kendra and her family. And so just glad to be reconnected. And that is one of the fun things about social media. I think you could kind of stay connected from afar and you are a, a real guru into understanding family history and genealogy. And <laughs> yeah. that is an understatement of the year, but you know, all the ways that all the people are related. So yeah. what, out of curiosity, what kind of got you into being interested in that specifically? We'll, we'll get into the other content here in a moment, but I'm curious about that. Yeah. So I've always been a history nerd and, um, you know, American, I was, especially as a kid, American history, the Revolutionary War, Civil War. And I was just kind of first off generally interested in how I was connected. You know, you hear from older family members, different kind of tall tales and you wonder where it is. But the thing that really set me off was um, when I was 12 or 13, there was a big debate in the fight family, which is the family you and I are connected with uh, on whether we were Dutch or German. And there was, a, I remember that at a Christmas party, it was a knockdown drag out on whether we were Dutch or German. And I was, I was really interested wow. to know what the answer to that was. And so, uh, so when I was, I think 13 years old is when I started doing genealogy and, uh, I've done thousands and thousands and thousands of hours in the last 22, 23 years, I think. Wow. It's so fascinating. Okay. And so tell us now, uh, a little bit of your story. What is it that you build? What are you currently staying busy with and a little bit of how you got there? Yeah, so I, I'm a United States Naval officer. Uh, I've been in the Navy for 15 years. So after I uh, graduated from Texas A&M, I went to officer candidate school, which for the Navy back then in 2007 was in Pensacola, Florida. And I am a professional surface warfare officer. Uh, when you hear that, you're like, what does that mean? I, I'm a traditional Naval officer, like the guys on the battleships back in World War II, you know, so I don't fly planes. I don't dive submarines. I don't, you know, halo jump with the Navy SEALs. I'm a traditional dude on the bridge of a ship. Uh, making it go fast, shooting guns. So that is, that's my career field in the Navy. So I build leaders. At the same time, I've also had a lot environment in the formal training process. So one of my tours of duty for almost four years was I was a, a Naval Science instructor, assistant professor of Naval Science at Rice University in Houston, Texas, where your grandfather went, where my great grandfather went. Uh, and I did that. And I taught, um, you know, several courses, especially Naval history, uh, for ROTC and just regular students. And then, you know, I was the senior watch officer responsible for all officer training on the ship where I was the senior department head. So I was like the number three on a ship of 300. So I was responsible for all officer training there. And then I am now the executive officer of a large training command, a new training command in the Navy that mm -hmm. specifically specializes in teaching mariners like uh, surface warfare officers and enlisted personnel that do navigation how to safely operate ships at sea. So I have a lot of experience in the training world of the Navy. That's kind of, we have for us as service warfare officers, we kind of have two careers. We have our mm -hmm. sea career, which is all the same. You're on a ship at sea. And then you have your shore duty career, 
I haven't had too much shore duty, but my shore duty career is training. Some people are manpower. Some people are financial uh, specialists. My shore duties have all been geared towards training. Hmm. Wonderful. So I wonder if we can maybe dig into that for a little bit as you think about, you know, in particular in your space within training, what do you think that people overcomplicate about leadership development, about training, um, anything around that? So to me, leadership is, is fun, fundamental to what we do in the military. It has mm -hmm. to work at every level, even at the lowest level, you know, there's, there's someone else below, right? And it's a constant system and a machine where new people are coming in and old people are going out. So we don't, we don't give you a lot of time before you're automatically in a leadership position. And sometimes it might just be one other person, right? And you're in charge of, you know, cleaning a, cleaning a hallway and, you know, one person is the person ultimately responsible. I think people try and make leadership complicated. They try and do too much. Mm -hmm. um, they try and have these grandiose plans. I like to run everything through the filter of history. And one of the things mm -hmm. that when you study, like via the Naval War College, you study, especially like World War II, you know, the Japanese had a very successful very large naval fleet um, and they lost it all. And one of the reasons they lost it all is they had very overly complicated plans. Um, you really have to get leadership is really about taking the, the grandiose idea, kind of like the movie inception. You got, you have to get it down to its, mm -hmm. its kernel. What is the kernel of what you're trying to get to? And then you need to make sure that everyone understands that. So Napoleon, the famous French general there, there's a concept called Napoleon's corporal where, um, you know, Napoleon's generals would come up with a plan and then they had to explain it to a corporal who's a, who's a junior enlisted person. And if the junior enlisted person could not recite the plan that they just taught him, it was too complicated. That's the mm -hmm. idea behind Napoleon's corporal. Mm -hmm. And so to me that what people overcomplicate is they try and give the grand vision in every one of its minute details. And really you just need to give people, this is what the base mission is, and this is what your piece of the mission is. So you need to have one person that's in charge. You can't have 10 people in charge of one thing, one person in charge, and you let them, you know, know that this is the clear intent of what your job mm -hmm. is and what you need to accomplish. I also think that how people overcomplicate it is they try and copy other people. And that's my big problem with leadership is that I've learned um, both in the Navy and in my you know personal world where I've kind of had some leadership roles as well. You have to tailor your leadership style to you. And so I'm one of these guys that really hates and it, I'm, it's, it's very unpopular, but I really hate leadership books. I, I don't like them, you know, because at the end of the day, it's someone taking the things that worked for them and almost prescribing it for you. Um, and, you know, if you're a very similar personality to them, that might work for you. But you know what? I, I, I just can't stand another book from some, you know, Navy uh, military people are the worst. They're like, you know, <laughs> 10 ways to be a Navy SEAL or, you know, 10, 10 ways to steer, steer business like a ship, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I just feel I, I like biography better. Um, mm. I like reading what great leaders in the past have done because they haven't tried to copy other people. They know mm. what their strengths are. They're very honest about what their strengths are. They're very honest about what their weaknesses are. And if they're really good, they maximize their strengths and they learn how to mitigate their weakness. And I think that too many people coming out of college, especially as military officers, they're trying to find the secret sauce instead of the introspective and saying, look, I'm really good at these mm -hmm. things and I'm really not good at these things. So this is what I'm going to put in place to mitigate that. And then I'm going to hit hard on what I'm what I'm good at. Yeah. One of the things that makes me think about is, um, the idea of there's profound insight in simplicity, which was Jim Collins, not a leadership book, but a business book. But, um, and I'm I've not judging anyone all... that reads leadership books. No, I know. I know. I know. <laughs> love, I love reading all the things. So I've read them all. Um, I, and there was a military one that I liked that was about turning the ship around or something like that. I, I liked specifically the phrase of empowering your people to say, I intend to, and that I have taken forward from that particular book. But anyway, this idea of Napoleon's corporal and profound insight in simplicity, I think that something I've noticed is as information has become commoditized and so available and so uh, ever present in books and online and all of that, do you think that that's a piece of it for people that 
they're just they're overwhelmed by how much information there even is to access and they think there is always this next thing to learn and grow like what's the balance of that versus having the mindset of wanting to grow and and shift and become the leader that you are like are those at odds yeah no i don't think they're at odds i think I think this is our problem. I love learning. I can't get enough of school. I love, oh, I, I would be in school every day for the rest of my life if I could. I love it. What I think the problem is, you know, I read a book a long time ago called Why Johnny Can't Preach, which I thought it was a little short little book. But the principal argument was Johnny can't preach because Johnny can't read. And what it wasn't saying is that it's not saying that Johnny was illiterate. It's that he was illiterate. He didn't know how to read in context. I think on a, I think on a large scale, we're really good at being connected. We're really good at having resources. We're really good, I think, at finding those resources. I think our number one problem is because of all that technology and all the stream of info that can flood in at any time, we don't know how to stop and think and to think deeply and to think and to point that powerful tool at introspection really inside and saying, you know, this is really who I am. In one side, there's the, well, I don't want to, I don't want to talk up my strengths because I don't want to seem braggy or braggadocious. You know, I don't want to look, I don't want to look prideful. At the same time, we look at it and we go, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't really have, you know, my weaknesses aren't really that bad, you know. And I just think that people are good at finding the resources, but again, they're reading other people's magic. And you know what? Maybe, maybe this guy wrote a book or this gal wrote a book and it has 10 life lessons. And maybe you get one or two lessons from that. I'm all for that. But I think it's foolish to say I can pick up a book on leadership by George W. Bush and think that I can be George W. Bush. I'm not that guy. We're all different. I believe we've all been made a particular way and we all have different things we bring to the table and things we don't. You know, So leadership, I think a lot of times you find in leadership is people try and be something they're not because they're trying to emulate someone they're not. And then at the yeah. end of the day, you know, we're in the great age of genuineness. People want genuine mm -hmm. and people will adapt to your leadership style if you, if you know your style. Mm. That made me think about something else when you're talking about knowing your strengths and weaknesses. And then I want to connect this to learning. And so from your perspective as a leader of learning and training, um, how do you help the people that you lead recognize that in themselves. And so, because I believe there's exponential power in people themselves as learners, right? If we can activate that, then they go seek the resources and they go, that's one of the premises of, you know, high quality learning and development culture is not just the learning and development people as gatekeepers to the content, but as kind of door openers and then activating those learners in themselves. So does that hold in your world of how you support people in understanding their strengths and weaknesses and then guide them towards the training that they need? Or is it much more prescriptive? Well, you know, in a military context, standardization is key. And so there's, there's not a lot of fudge in the curriculum. You know, you, <laughs> the Navy, uh, specifically, you know, who I work for, who I don't speak for, right? This is me as a person, right? Not as an official agent of the government. But, you know, we have thousands upon thousands of people that join the Navy every year. Uh, we're a technical environment. People have to learn to uh, learn that, uh, especially enlisted personnel or, or even officers. You know, they have to learn uh, the ins and out of this technical environment. And we don't have 10 years for them to get good. Like, we need people that are on ships, on submarines, working on planes. And so I think the one thing the military is very good at is we are very good at finding that that base knowledge, that kind of lowest mm -hmm. common denominator we need people to know. And we're very good about pressing that. And we're very good at teaching a lot of those things because we've had to teach them for a long time. In the Navy, the war, the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, especially in the early years, those were not Navy wars. And so a lot of the budget for the military was going to other sources. Um, and I think we really learned in the last you know, decade or so that we shortchanged ourselves specifically on training people how to drive ships at sea. And so we have completely done a rudder correction on that. I think we're going in a fantastic direction. But it is prescriptive. I can't just have an instructor stand up and say whatever they want. I need you to stick to the curriculum. What I do say is, so you ask yourself, well, what can I do? What can I do when I'm really not in control of the curriculum as an instructor? Mm -hmm. But people need to learn this. And I remember hearing a professor one time say, people don't learn 
a 100% of what I teach them. They learn 100% of what I'm excited about, mm. which really struck me. And so one of the things that I try and get through to the staff that works for me and then also the students um, that we have and that I've tried to do even in a civilian context or back when I was an ROTC instructor is you have to give people the so what. I had a boss that said there's the the so, so what, and so. Okay, the and so part specifically is so – and so what? Why, why do I need to know this? Why is this important? And you can stand up there and say, well, this is really important for safety of life at sea. Okay, that, that sounds pretty milquetoast. It sounds important, but it sounds milquetoast. <laughs> you got to get excited. You have, to, you have to paint a picture of this is what your job is. Your job is to stand on the bridge of a ship and have 300 human lives and a billion dollars and 9,000 long tons of American steel and diplomacy. At your control, when you are 23 years old, I need you to learn the rules of the road. I need you to know how to navigate that ship because if you don't do that, people are going to die. I think sometimes we are in an age where we try and coddle younger people. We try and make it seem like things are not going to be as hard as they are. I want people to embrace the challenge. I want them. I want it to be a source of pride that, hey, I do something that my buddies back home can't do and they won't do and they'll never do. Like, I want them to have pride in that. I want them to embrace that. That's one of the big things I think the military is good at is, you know, the, the term is embrace the suck. Um, not saying it sucks, but I, we want you to embrace, embrace the challenge. Like if it was easy, we wouldn't want you like this. This right. is a challenging job. What we do is, is dangerous, even when nothing bad in the world is going on. It's making me think, I think she's a current women's Duke basketball coach that had this uh, message that went viral about it's not just waiting for it to be easy, but it's learning how to do hard better was her ultimate message. Yes. And she was talking about, I think, incoming freshmen or, you know, on the team. And I, I played lacrosse in college. So I remember a similar type of message, like it's hard. And it is instead of trying to kind of protect ourselves as our brains may naturally want to do, we might want to naturally go towards comfort. It is this rewiring of saying, I'm going to go towards, in your case, the hard and dangerous work for a cause, for a purpose. So I think that's really interesting. I also think the idea of trying to avoid copying other people is important. As an entrepreneur, I find this and in working with just different clients, really staying true to that simplicity and that core of who you are and the core of who the client is, like learning who they are and not trying to fit an approach that worked for somebody else onto them. Maybe we can go into the daily flow and um, anything you've learned on productivity, balance that works for you. Yeah. So we like to, in the military, have fill white space with meetings, which I hate. I, I'm opposed to this. I am a, uh, a warrior against meetings, which my, my boss knows because as the executive officer, one of my jobs is the day-to-day -day schedule belongs to me for the command. Um, and as soon as I got in there, I started axing meetings left and right. Uh, and here's my problem is, you know, everyone's seen like the T-shirts or the notebooks, you know, that uh, meeting could have been an email. We spend so much time sitting in a room talking that we never sit and think. And we need people to think. We have big, big challenges in the military, in government, in, in the civilian sector, Fortune 500 companies, mom and pops. The world is changing. It's changing rapidly. And we just never, in my opinion, for the most part, give people a chance to sit and think. Like, I need you to just really use your brain. And I think meetings and stuff get in the way. So in my formal role is I like to consolidate meetings and uh, eliminate when possible. That being said, I'm also an information monster. So I'm a big believer in delegating. And it's really interesting when you meet different military officers. Some people are very... Like their personal schedule is incredibly regimented and they try and regiment the schedule of everyone that works for them in that way. But when you watch the movies about the military, it's like we all do the same thing and we all think the same. Nothing can be further from the truth. I mean, the Navy alone is an organization of 340,000 people in uniform, another almost 200,000 civilians. Uh, when you have over half a million people, like they're all people are going to think differently. We have to leverage that. We need to use that brain power. And so for me, my big thing is I, I came into the job. I like an actual hard copy schedule, piece of paper, not electronic. Um, when people send me invites, 
uh, even in my personal life, uh, it does not go into an iPhone or anything. It goes into an old blue uh, planner uh, in my kindergarten handwriting. Um, and I like that. I like having a tangible s- schedule, something that I can write on, something that I can mark off. Because I'm a big believer that you think when you, when you read a book, mm-hmm. for example, and you read it with a pen in your hand, mm-hmm. you become an active learner, not a passive mm-hmm. learner. And it's possible to read and still be passive. But when you have that pen in your hand, there's an action between your brain and the hand that's doing that work. So that's me. So I like process, but I'm not a process monster. Mm -hmm. I like things to be efficient, to be timely, and to not waste time. To me, time is the most valuable commodity. You can always get more money back. Your house could burn down tomorrow. You, You could get another house eventually, right? And not to belittle anyone who's lost their house, but... At the end of the day, time. You will never, ever get time back. It, to me, it is the most valuable commodity you have as a human being. And so I don't want I, I to waste other people's. I certainly don't want to waste mine. So I actually use a hard copy schedule. I make my staff use a hard copy schedule. And then the thing about it, though, is I'm willing to improvise. You have to be mm. – in the military especially, you can't have a rigid – you can't have a rigid anything. Situation changes – you have to be able to adapt. Adaptability is an important part of what we do. And then I let people run their own their own spheres of influence. I call them their fiefdoms. If I have three or four department heads that work for me as the executive officer, I'm not going to do their job. Uh, if they do their job wrong, I'm not going to fix the thing they did wrong. I'm going to make them go back and fix it. I'm a big believer in accountability and ownership. Uh, and I'm a big believer that your particular piece of the pie is important. And I expect you who's getting a paycheck to actually do that. I think some people are afraid of that. Some people are kind of micromanagers. They really Mm -hmm. want to hold on to it. They really want to control it. But I think if you do that, for the most part, people will surprise you. Mm -hmm. I mean, they feel like they own it. And that's kind of one of the things that people have told me before when I've come into a new job is like, hey, I want to own this for you. Great. You own it now. um, (laughs) And you're going to be responsible for owning it. Yeah, no, because I've done kind of their job before. Um, I'm not interested in doing it again. And like I said, some people, they hold the reins too tight. What I care about, what I tell them is, look, you have complete control over your fiefdom. The only thing you owe me is information. Mm -hmm. And if you don't give me the information, then I'm going to come beating down the doors for it. But feed the bear the information. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to step in your, in your sphere and start telling you how to, how to manage your day. Like that's, that's your job. Um, And I I think that for the most part that works well. Yeah. I was just going to say that made me think that it connects to something I've seen around autonomy as highly connected to motivation theory. Daniel Pink speaks to that about how people, you know, more than a financial incentive, they found autonomy was a big piece to motivation and keeping people engaged in their work. And that's what you just described. People being given that leadership role for themselves of what they can then go do and being inspired and clear about the expectations, then they can, you've set them up for success for them to go and do that or, or learn and address it. That was also making me think about something you said was that you have done their job. Do you think that is a key piece to being a leader that you have to have done the thing that you're asking them to do, or are there instances in which that doesn't necessarily have to be the case? Ready, go. Yeah, I don't think (laughs) it has to be the case because, you know, there are, for the simple reason that, specifically for the officers, right? The officers that work for me are surface warfare officers, right? So I started at the bottom like they did and worked my way up like they did right out of college. The enlisted sailors, though, that joined right out of high school that are in very technical rates. I've never done their job specifically. I've managed people like them before that have done that job, but I've never turned the wrench. Officers are managers. They're not technicians for the most part. So I would not say that you have to have done their job. There was a discussion, I think, several years ago about bringing in officers into the military at senior ranks who were not who did not start at the bottom, who are coming in from the corporate world and are already leaders in the corporate world and coming in at a higher rank. And I remember, and I don't, to be honest, I can't remember what branch of the service said what and did what. But at the end of the day, there's something to be said in just my personal opinion. You know, I'm, I'm not a new guy. There's, there's one of those things where I can imagine the civilian world, you're sitting back and you get a new hire in who's, a man, who's your manager. Mm-hmm. And maybe they've been in the business world 20 years. 
but they've never been in your field before. Maybe they were at a tech company and now this is more of a you know manufacturing company. So they have 20 years of management experience, but not in the field that you're in. Mm. But then say you're the you're the guy or gal that's been doing the actual boots on the ground, you know the ins and outs of every part of this process, and you've been doing it for for you know 15 years. Um, and this person comes in and doesn't kind of know what you know, I, I can see how that would be discouraging. In my field, that's not the case, right? Everyone who works for me has less time as an officer than me. Mm -hmm. uh, my boss has more time as an officer than I do. So it's one of those things where you, you can kind of always look up the rung and know that the person, you know, if you're a lieutenant, you look up at a lieutenant commander, a lieutenant commander looks up at a commander, and you, you know instinctively, without even thinking about it, that that person has more experience. Now, it doesn't necessarily right. mean they have great judgment, right? So I'm not, I'm not advocating that you take advice from everyone. Uh, but what it does indicate is, hey, that person has been an officer longer than I have been. Maybe I can bounce this off them and they've mm -hmm. seen this before. And I think once you realize that, and I think for the most part, we do realize that, uh, it creates a lot of trust, I would mm -hmm. say, in the system. When I get a new, when I get a new boss in the military, I instinctively trust them. They don't have to earn my trust. Mm -hmm. It's the opposite. They, they, they could lose my trust, but I instinctively think like, mm -hmm. hey, this, this guy or gal has been in the business certain many of years. They've commanded this. Like I, we, all of us expect them to know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Whereas I would say <laughs> not having been in the civilian sector, but I could imagine that that's not the case necessarily in, you know, a Fortune 500 company. Yeah. That's so interesting. I think that um, so much of that around trust and psychological safety, there's lots of discussion around that in leadership corporate circles in how do we develop that. And you've just hit on some of the things that I think make your um, space really unique um, and the structures that are there and the clarity that's there, the kind of instant built in trust from the structure of hierarchy, from the structure of history, from the structure of protocols, even of, of who gets hired where. So that's really uh, just fascinating to think about. I, I'm thinking back to what you were saying about we don't have enough time to just think and be. I, I would 100% agree. Um, you know, maybe it's like antithetical to the idea of stopping to think openly, but I've read several books about this topic. So it's kind of funny, um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> about no more meetings or just like thinking about it in different ways. But um, how, how do you like to think about, you talked about consolidating the meetings um, for people that maybe feel, for any of our listeners that are in different roles where they feel like, I don't know how to change the culture of back-to-back -back meetings. I don't know how to advocate for that time to think or space to think. How would you help them maybe talk about it or position it as equally, if not more valuable than whatever might have been on the agenda? Yeah, I, that's a great question because I actually had to do that. So, you know, um, the very first thing I did was I had the luxury, and we don't always have this in the military, of having um, – a decent amount of time where I was at the command when, and the person I was going to relieve in the job was still there, which gave me time to kind of go around to all of the different fiefdoms, like I said, and talk to the people that work there, talk to the officers, talk to the enlisted, you know, what, what is working right now at the command? What is not working? What, what do you think should change? And um, meetings were a huge thing. And one of the reasons they, you know, they had, they had, you know, there's a complicated backstory with it all. But basically, the quest for meetings was not one to waste time. It was one to that came out of a very good intention, which was we want everyone to feel valued and that their opinions mm -hmm. are being heard on a regular basis. The issue was just that people felt that they weren't getting enough time to do the other things that they were responsible mm -hmm. for. And, you know, my boss is was very recent. Uh, in the job as well. I just had to advocate like, hey, sir, I think it's awesome that um, you want people to feel valued. I'm telling you, I think they do feel valued. Um, but one of the ways we could do that is maybe shifting to, and then in the military, we have a thing called all hands call, which is usually where the commanding officer gets in front of the entire command, kind of addresses their concerns, lets them know kind of what the vision going in the future is. And usually if you're on a ship, this would happen, depending on the ship, but probably once a month you'd have an all hands call on a shore command. It's not as easy, especially at a training command because so much of my workforce is busy teaching and I can't pull them out of the classroom 
uh, to do that. And so, you know, what I went to, to my boss with was, hey, sir, first off, you know, I'm the executive officer. I own the schedule. Let me own it for you. And if you let me own it, here's what's going to happen. One, I'm going to free up time for you to think because what really his vision and the way it should work is my boss is he's the ideas guy. He is the vision caster. He's the guy that's, you know, going outside and projecting what we are to the outside world. I'm supposed to be the guy that makes the trains run on time. So I said, first off, give me give me the schedule and I'm going to give you more time back so that you can do the thing that you're really good at and that you really want to do, which is that kind of vision casting. Um, you know, let me do the nitty gritty. At the same time, you know, I've talked to the crew. They feel valued. They don't necessarily need all this time. But we can institute an all hands call once a month. And that still gives you the opportunity to get in front of everyone at the same time. And I talked to all of my training directorates and said, hey, when you're planning your curriculum schedules, the first Friday of every month, you need to block off an hour. And we're going to do an all hands call during that time. And we had like a two hour meeting about it because, um, you know, he was and I was brand new. So I kind of had the new guy credibility uh, or maybe not credibility. Um, maybe like, hey, I'm just the new guy, but <laughs> yeah. um, kind of card that I could play. And uh, he was like, you know what? And this is a great sign of leadership. He says, you know what? I don't know if I'm necessarily convinced, but I'm going to let you run with it since you feel strongly about it. And we'll see what happens. Um, and it seems like and it seems like everyone is enjoying how or, you know, is liking the, the process. But at the end of the day, he recognized like, hey, I've got a capable person that works for me. Uh, he thinks that there's a way to do this that maybe I haven't thought of. I don't necessarily know if it's going to work, but let's give it a try. You know, he wants to own it. Let him own it. Um, and I really appreciated that because that's what good leaders do. And I, that's yeah. what I try and do with the people that work for me. So what I would say is if you're trying to break that culture is one, you, you need to do the hard work is really not selling it. In my opinion, the hard work is actually getting down and talking to, you know, the boots on the ground, what's going on? Like, how could we be more efficient? I think senior leaders would be shocked sometimes at the good ideas that come out of their very junior personnel. Sometimes a 19 or 20 year old, just they see something wrong and they instantly know what it is. And it's bypassed all the 40 and 50 year olds. So, you know, and then it also buys you credibility with them because they say, Hey, this senior leader actually cares about my opinion. And especially once they give the opinion and then a week or two later, they actually see the thing that they wanted changed like that, that engenders a lot of trust. I feel that's such a powerful story. And I really like the sentence then that your leader used, you know, in I'm not convinced yet, but I'll, I'll let you go ahead with it and see, because, um, it, it just shows a powerful that it doesn't have to be yes, absolutely. Or no, definitely not. It can be this with a clear action step to go forward and try it. Um, so thank you for that story because I think it's just a really powerful example. What is what current problem or challenge that you're trying to solve that maybe we can think on for a moment and then we'll get to some of the future facing stuff? In my sphere, I think what's, what's the hardest, leaders act. Um, you, have, you have to make a decision. I think that can be challenging. It's very intimidating. I, I don't think people really realize it who have not been in the military. But when I graduated college, I was 20 years old. I went to OCS when I was 21. I showed up on the ship, 21 years old. And within a month, they gave me a division of 10 people that worked for me. And the principal guy that worked for me had been in the Navy for 19 years. I was two years old when he joined the Navy. And he, he worked for me. That's an, ex an extremely uh, intimidating environment to walk into because you know that you don't know what they know. You know that you, you might be smart, you might be capable, but you just do not have the experience. And so I think what that can create is for especially younger officers, it can create a problem in decision making. Mm. Uh, we want to have all the answers. We want to have you know, if I need, if I want a hundred pieces of data to make a decision, I want all hundred pieces of data. And we have to be realists, especially in our line of work, that that's not going to happen. You have to be comfortable making decisions with 80% of the solution. And you know what? You might be wrong. But one of the things we teach young officers, and I don't know, I, I'd be really interested to hear from you how this works in the civilian world. We, we teach them 
at the end of the day, if there's a decision to be made, you have to make it, even if you have incomplete information. And you know what? You might be wrong. Mm. We'll figure that out later. The worst thing you can do is make no decision. And people will not, people instinctively will not follow leaders that don't make decisions. They won't. Um, so I want to try and teach young officers is, hey, at the end of the day, you're going to be on the bridge of a ship and you're going to have to make a decision based on the information that you have. Mm. I, I pray that you have all the time in the world to make that decision. But I know for a fact that it's not always going to be that way. You need to take the, the basis of what you have, the recommendations from your team, your own experience, and then you may need to make a decision and enforce that decision. Mm. I, I, I had a boss recently who he said, he, he put out these first principles, which were amazing. And he came up with all of them himself. So he didn't steal them from anybody else. But, you know, his number one principle, one of his number one principles was be right, be wrong, but be. You mm. have, as a leader, you have to be. Uh, and so uh, just getting people to, to be comfortable making decisions, even if they're wrong. Like, you know, we cannot have in the military, and we've been talking about this for years now, um, or in the civilian sector, we can't have a zero defect mentality. People are going to make mistakes. People are going to make bad calls. I had a professor at A&M who said that good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. Um, <laughs> we have to we have to allow, you know, it's kind of like uh, in like a big, I, I think in like big stores like Walmart, for example, they factor in that people are going to steal stuff, right? Now, like it goes into the way that they do their profit margins. There's always going to be some level of loss or, or some level of, of you know, TVs that come in that are damaged. In the same way, you know, we need to not accept personal sh shortcomings. So, you know, uh, for us, integrity is important. So I'm not saying like, hey, you know, you lied or you, you, you broke the law or something like that. But if you made like an honest de decision in leadership that just turned out to be wrong, that's, that's a mentorship opportunity. And that's going to make you a better leader. And if you go through just one thing that reading biography has taught me, is that the greatest leaders have made some of the biggest mistakes. Um, and a lot of times they had people that came alongside them and mentored them, and sometimes they didn't. I read a, a phenomenal biography of Winston Churchill last year, and I think we all think now, especially of our generation, if we even know who he is, we look back at him as just kind of this magisterial figure that helped World War II. Um, but people thought he was a crazy man before he was prime minister. I mean, and he had failed not at one thing or two things. He had five major political failures um, that e any single one would have doomed anybody else. Uh, mm. But he was Winston Churchill. That's, uh, you know, he 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 learned from his mistakes. And he was again. And that's one of the things the biography talked about. It talked about how he made a serious mistake in the First World War when he was first sea lord of not listening to his senior leadership. And making a decision that was a terrible decision, he ended up having to resign, the Gallipoli disaster. And so when he came into World War II as prime minister, even though he was incredibly opinionated and all those other things, if all of his senior leadership said, no, we should not do it, even if he thought he should, he would not. He had learned that lesson. Mm -hmm. you got to trust your senior leadership. I think that that we have to have room in whatever our battle space is for people to make honest mistakes. And we need to take those opportunities, not to crush them, but to build them back up. And I, I think most people who you handle that way, they take failure and they turn it later on into success. Mm. That's so powerful. It's making me think about um, something I recently read. I was looking for the author um, was Essentialism, the Disciplined Pursuit of Less um, by Greg McCowan. And um, I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was in this book that there, he had one of those matrices that was about decision making. And so imagine on the X axis, reversible or irreversible, and on the Y axis, um, consequential or inconsequential. And then he talks about how if it's um, an irreversible and consequential decide slowly if it's inconsequential and reversible act quickly and so on and so forth in each of those kind of areas and I have that on my wall um, because I am a recovering perfectionist and um, I don't <laughs> yeah yeah it's true and I don't like to make mistakes, Jason. I don't yep. know if this is a fight trait. No, I don't think it's a fight trait. <laughs> yeah, um, no, maybe I, it's I on the it. other side. Maybe it's on my Miller side. So to do the things I want to do, which where I want to head is 
bolder than I've been in the past. I want to support my clients who are doing impactful work. And I always want to push the envelope to be learning myself. And I'm also afraid of making mistakes. And so it is that, <laughs> like, it's yeah. that reminder yeah. that I know I have many soundtracks and mantras around this that momentum is messy and, you know, all the things that you just shared too. I like but that. I That's think. Good. Sometimes um, I need a good uh, X, Y axis to help me make those decisions and be like, okay, this one is reversible. I can, you know, make that call and do it. If you, and got, this one... if you get time, if you get time to make the spreadsheet, yeah. Yeah, well, it's just a little sticky note with the, you know, okay, where does that one fall? <laughs> okay, I can decide slowly. But maybe that's, I need to hardcore. institute this. Definitely the more time to think I'm really taking something away from that because as somebody who's rather uh, driven to be productive, air quote, I continue to find the value in slowing down to go fast and also the kind of seasonality of it or the ebb and flow of uh, many times in my work, there's a sprint and a big event that we're putting on or I'm helping a client with developing content that'll be go, go, go until it's not. And then it's done. And I'm like, well, what do I do now? You know? Um, and yeah, so but I, I think, think, I think you've yeah. already done some, you've already done some of the hard work though, which is the introspection, you know, you know, what kind of personality you are. Right. And so, and so you like, right. A recovering perfectionist, which I totally understand. Uh, cause I, I'm my own worst critic. Um, I, I never finish anything and think, uh, I took a test the other day and I got an 88 and I just came to bed like dejected. And my wife's like, "You got what are you talking about? Like, that's a phenomenal grade for this kind of test. And I'm like, no, I feel terrible. I think it's, I, but I, that, I want to go back just real quick to the introspection piece because it goes back mm. to several of the areas we've talked about is, mm -hmm. even though I hate these kind of books, um, Sarah, my wife, made me read 15 <laughs> years ago. I read the, uh, what is it? The Five Love Languages. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, which, which actually has been incredibly helpful for me as a leader in the sense of, you know, going back to what people overcomplicate. Um, and in this way, it might be undercomplicate. You, when you watch the movies about the military, it's, hey, do this. And it's like, yes, sir. You know, um, that's not really how it works uh, as much as we would like it to. To really get the best out of people, you have to know what motivates them. And that's the thing that makes leadership hard. You have to be in some level a people person. And by people person, I don't mean you don't necessarily have to be the life of every party, but you have to be discerning about how people make decisions. And I think really good leaders, they not only know their own strengths and weaknesses, they know the strengths and weaknesses of their team, and they adapt their leadership style for individual members. So I had two officers that worked for me when I was a department head on a ship. And one of them was, she was kind of a hard charger. You just give her the mission and she goes on and she goes with it. If she made a mistake and I brought her in and started, you know, yelling at her, like something you would see in the movies, she would, she would, she would clam up. She would, she would take it very personally and probably, I probably would not get the level of work out of her I needed. That's not, that was not the way to respond to her. To her, it was like, Hey, I know you thought this was a good decision. Let's talk about why we could have maybe done something better. And I didn't have to have many of those conversations with her. On the other side, I had another guy work for me, same level as her, who he basically told me one day that the only thing that he that motivated him was, you know, kind of getting kicked in the butt, which is not my normal leadership style. And I'm like, are you really sure that that's what you mean? He's like, yeah, I mean, I know myself well enough. And, and, and he was true to his word. Like he he's a guy that I had to be more stern with in a way that I'm not normally that way. But it was the only way to motivate him to get the best out of him that I needed. Mm. So uh, the love languages book helped me in that way because I realized um, that, so my love language is I'm words of affirmation. As a perfectionist, I want to be told that I'm a good dog, you know, and kind of petted. I don't need, I don't need a lot. I don't need a lot of time off, I, you know, or a, you know, quality time or any of this. I just need to be told every now and then like, hey, Jason, you're killing it. Like you're crushing <laughs> it. Well done. And I'm like, oh, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> but what I also recognized is, um, Several of my people that work for me in the past have said that I don't do, give lots of words of affirmation. Ah, I was like, what are you talking about? It's my love language. 
And then one of my, one of my lieutenants said, well, you, you actually don't speak your love language. And I was like, whoa, like, what are you talking about? And then I really sat down and I thought about it and they're absolutely right. I like to receive words of affirmation, but my love language that I project outward is gift giving. I love to give gifts mm. and, and it kind of helped me understand my own strengths and it has helped me immeasurably in working with other people because I think a leader has to be able to size up their team. You know who you can trust and who you can't trust, but you have to know more than that. You need to know what can I trust them with? How much leash can I give them, right? Are they completely mm -hmm. autonomous? Or are they someone that really needs to have daily touch points? And I think that that's the part of leadership, the secret sauce that no one can teach you because it's going to be completely different in every scenario completely different. And you just, as a leader, you have to, you have to do the work and just listen to people when they talk, just listen, get to know them. Um, where are they from? What motivates them? You know, do they like time off? Are they the kind of person that likes to get awards? You know, we call it chess candy in the military. Is that what they care about? <laughs> do they want to be told that they're, that they're, you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread? Um, and I think once you real once you realize that and you gear leadership towards that, you're just going to see exponential uh, increase in productivity and efficiency mm -hmm. and trust. It's so powerful because everything you've laid out in our conversation thus far, nothing is unreachable that you described in leadership, which as we think about making leadership accessible to more people, to people with different experiences, you know, depending on what the uh, space that we're in is, it seems to me that you don't have to have a specific pedigree. You don't have to have a specific set of experiences necessarily to do that work. You have to be introspective you have to know yourself you have to know be willing to learn your team and i think the other thing that has been the theme throughout is you have to be willing to take the action and then to learn from the results of the action and keep going forward um okay what uh, is something that you are looking forward to in the future you see ahead anything fun there in your future well so yeah yeah, so I've been selected to command a warship, so uh, I will start the training for that uh, next summer or fall, so in about nine-ish months or so. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. Obviously, I've done <clears throat> several ship tours before, and the commanding officer of a ship is the goal that all of us surface warfare officers who make a career of the Navy are striving towards. So it feels really good to have uh, been selected for it, so to have yes. you know achieved the selection milestone. But now... Getting selected is one thing. Now now comes the hard work. The way we do it is you go to a ship and you're the executive officer for a year and a half. Then you get about a month or two off and then you come back as the commanding officer. And it's, and it's two different jobs. So, you know, you kind of have to tailor your personality not only to which of those two jobs you're doing, XO or CO, but really also, especially in the XO role, who your CO is, right? You need to be able to understand what your boss's strengths and weaknesses are. And I think of the, if you really want to be a strong number two, like I'm a great wingman, to be a really good wingman, you need to mitigate your boss's weakness and you need to, you know, allow, find opportunities for them to highlight their strengths. So it's a team sport. Uh, we have to acknowledge, uh, you know, every member of the team has strengths. Every member of the team has weaknesses. And so I'm, I'm excited at, at doing both jobs. One is more kind of what I'm doing now, which is the day-to-day, -day, and the other one's more of the, the cognitive, um, cerebral um, deal, and I'm looking forward to both. That is so awesome. Well, congratulations. Well-deserved, and all the words of affirmation you. for you, because you deserve it, and I, <laughs> um, I know that those decisions are obviously not taken lightly, and that's a huge accomplishment. Okay, let's do any top highlights from the book recommendations or podcast recommendations or anything else? Yeah. So, yeah. So for podcasts, I don't listen to a lot of podcasts because I like to listen to audiobooks instead. Um, so I don't usually listen to music. I listen to audiobooks, and I, I kind of have an eclectic, you know, history and astronomy and things like that. My, the four book recommendations, uh, I, these are four books that I would recommend to anyone. The first one was David McCullough's John Adams written by a Pulitzer prize winner. It's just a, it, first off, it's a fun book, but the thing I love about John Adams is I feel really bad for him because of all the founding fathers, I feel very strong in saying he was the most important. You know, we give a lot to George Washington. We give a lot to Thomas Jefferson. We give a lot to Ben Franklin. But the actual workhorse on the ground that made the American Revolution really happen was John Adams. 
Um, and the thing that I like about John Adams is that he was incredibly opinionated and fiercely intelligent and he wanted to be popular, but he never did the popular thing over the right thing. And he knew that that would cost him the popularity that he really, you know, he wanted to be as big as George Washington or Ben Franklin. Um, but he wasn't. Uh, and he always put the country over himself. So to me, again, biography to, to me is one of the greatest leadership teachers. To me, that's a lesson in putting your own personal wishes aside for the good of the country. The other book, Team of Rivals, Doris Kearns Goodwin, an amazing book about Abraham Lincoln. Um, I'm not going to lie to you. I cried several times when I read that book. I just could not. I still can't believe that we were blessed with such a leader as Abraham Lincoln. Like he truly was an amazing person. And one of the things that made him so amazing was his magnanimity, his ability to put aside slights for the good of the country and for the good of the team. So, you know, team of rivals is about, he took all the guys that had better credentials than him that all wanted to be president over him. And that frankly should have been nominated over him based on their popularity. And he put them all in his cabinet which was at one point a shrewd maneuver to kind of keep uh, all of the uh, his adversaries inside the tent. But he also realized that these were the best men to help run the country and that the country needed these men. And he was willing to put up with, um, you know, and some of them kind of really did him dirty. He always put the good of the country or the team above what was good for Abraham Lincoln. So another valuable lesson there. Two other ones, The Field of Blood, I read by Joanne Freeman. Uh, it's about violence in Congress before the Civil War. It's a scary book to read, kind of in today's culture. We like to think that there was this time in the past when everyone in Washington, D.C. kind of held hands and skipped. Uh, and that's not what the 1820s through the 1850s was. Um, it was very acrimonious. And really, the, the lesson I learned is, you know, what happens when a body politic based on compromise uh, no longer allows its members to compromise. Uh, and uh, a lot of violence involved, a lot of violence on the floor of the House of Representatives. It's kind of a wild tale. So I recommend that one. And then the other one is I'm a huge astronomy nerd. So I was listening to a book recently called The Hunt for Vulcan. Basically, a long story short is Mercury. They couldn't figure out why Mercury's orbit was the way it was. It wasn't doing what Newton, Isaac Newton said it should do. And they thought it must be another planet pulling on it because that that's Uranus had kind of the same thing. And they, they said, Hey, there must be another planet call. And they said, it should be right here. And they looked and they found it and they called it Neptune. So people kept rediscovering this planet by Mercury that didn't exist because they had no ability to adjust their cognitive framework. They said, the only thing that could explain this is another planet. And it's not true. Einstein came along and said, actually, there's this thing called space time. And when you're around a large mass and gravity and all this kind of other scientific stuff. But at the end of the day, it's a fascinating tale about in science, which is the quest for what can we know and what can we falsify? We just repeatedly for about 100 years, about 70 or 80 years, kept rediscovering a planet that didn't exist. So it's it, to that me, it's, it's a fun tale. But it's also a, a, a cautionary tale mm. about what happens when we're so dedicated to our framework that we're not able to process information that conflicts with it. Mm. Relevant. Okay, and where can folks find you if anybody wants to connect on history, theology, astronomy, genealogy, or the military? Where can they find you? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a 36 year old dinosaur, so I am on Facebook. I was a trendsetter. That was the last thing I was ever a trendsetter about in the tech world. So I think I'm Jason.fight.50 um, picture of my face, but I don't have any of the Instagram or any of those other things. I'm happy for people to message me if they're interested, but yeah, that's kind of where you find me. Awesome. Jason, thank you so much. This is so fun. I learned so much. And I know our listeners will too. So thank you for your time and just sharing your insights with us. Thanks so much for listening to the Building Thinkers podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. And if you enjoyed what you heard, please leave a podcast rating and review. That helps more listeners find us in the world of podcasting algorithms. You can find out more about my learning and development strategy services at buildingthinkers.com. And remember, there's no limit to what you can learn.